On this episode of O'Fallon Matters, learn more about Proposition 1 and how it impacts you. Discover a sacred treasure in the heart of O'Fallon and see how the Fort Zumwalt School District is leading the way in science and technology curriculum. All this and more on O'Fallon Matters. Welcome to O'Fallon Matters. The Mayor's Youth Advisory Council recently held an event with special significance for the O'Fallon community. Joe Meyer was there to capture the highlights from an afternoon of equality. O'Fallon's Mayor's Youth Advisory Council continued their commitment to our community with a special presentation on Black History Month and diversity. Well, we're just here to talk to our society, to our community about Black History Month. So I feel like while people know the name, they don't actually know what it's about or what it encompasses. We're going to tell people like, well, just who the black community is, how much they've done in our society, how they've impacted us through history. Because they are, they're a huge part of our society, it's ingrained in us. And we all know black people, we all meet people every day, we talk to them, we're friends with them. So it just shows us their side of the story. An afternoon to remember kicked off with a brief history of the city of O'Fallon and its African American past and audience members were treated to an emotional speech from Jim Frank regarding O'Fallon's first African-American cemetery. You need to go by Sage Chapel Cemetery. Sage Chapel Cemetery is the African-American cemetery that's in O'Fallon. We know of 40 gravestones that you can actually see the names on. We have a wonderful lady, Mary Hogan Smith, who's done a lot of research. And she has done so much research for four or five years. And we know now of the names and the dates of close to 100 people that we know that are there. The highlight of the afternoon was a special video produced by the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council and O'Fallon TV. Well, today we're allowing residents to view a short interview segment about uh, other local residents of the city giving their thoughts and feelings. These are real people giving their thoughts and feelings about Black History Month and the nature of Black History Month, including some of the youth. It helps give people a fresh perspective on what the youth might be thinking and what other adults in the area will think. Phyllis Hayden was backed by popular demand with her authentic portrayal of Sojourner Truth. I could work as hard and eat as much as any man, well, when I could get it. And ain't I a woman? I've born 13 children and seen most all sold into slavery. And when I cried with my mother's tears, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? In the end, the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council accomplished their goal of educating us on black history, diversity, and unity. I think this event is really important um, to the people of O'Fallon because um, there aren't many events like it in the area um, and there haven't been in the past. I think it's really important that we recognize all members of our community and the fact that um, we have a shared history but um, some of those paths um, divert a little bit from each other and so um, by recognizing our differences we can better uh, understand each other and come together as a community. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. In April, O'Fallon voters will decide on an important issue affecting the future of O'Fallon's law enforcement. O'Fallon TV's Brett Figgis has this story. An emergency can happen on any day at any time. 
you dial 911 and the call is received by O'Fallon's Dispatch Center, located on the second floor of our City Hall Police Station. Officers here in the locker room, located on the second floor, and here in the CSS room down on the first floor, and even here in the basement, changing into their work clothes in the overflow lockers, are called to respond to this emergency. If they need to load up on equipment, they'll find the armory here on the second floor, and extra radios can be found here in an office with some spare room. Our fleet of patrol cars and support vehicles are waiting for them here in the northern edge of the City Hall parking lot. To respond, our officers will need to head west to Main Street or east towards Sondred Street. If a train is passing through, all of our officers will need to swing around to Woodlawn Avenue to bypass it, adding critical moments to their response time. These are some of the challenges we face every day. You know, we have a very highly rated police department. In fact, we're uh, almost every year rated as one of the safest cities in, in, in America. However, we do have some drawbacks, and the drawbacks basically is our facility. You know, if we want to stay up to pace with uh, everything that's going on, especially nowadays when you talk about uh, technology, we need a facility that we can count on, something that we can work with. A new facility gives us that opportunity to, to keep pace with, with all the changes that's going on in the criminal justice system today. To safely care for a city of our size, our officers need equipment, training rooms, gun ranges, detention cells, patrol cars, and quite simply, space to do their jobs. Our police station was designed to handle a city of up to 60,000 residents when it was constructed in 1999 and house the room and equipment necessary for a force of 66 sworn officers. Today, O'Fallon's incredible economic growth and civic development has meant that we've far exceeded those numbers. O'Fallon's current population is 82,000 residents, a number still growing faster than ever. We've nearly doubled our police force, and we've taken on a leadership role in St. Charles County law enforcement. We have a commitment to keep our city safe, and that commitment goes from the chief of police all the way down to the patrol officers. But this facility causes us some problems. The facility that we have now doesn't allow for the proper storage of evidence. We're completely maxed out in our our uh, evidence storage facility. We're using every nook and cranny like stairwells and every every open space and offices for storage of equipment. And, and we have a courtroom that is a temporary meeting room. It's a meeting room for the rest of City Hall. And we, uh, we march prisoners down our office hallway and through an open lobby of City Hall when we have to take prisoners over to court. It's not a way of doing business. Our elected officials really looked at the priorities of the city last year and they recognized that the number one priority for our city going forward was the need to expand our police station and make sure that we have a facility that will allow our officers to continue to serve our residents in the future. We have a facility right now that we've simply outgrown already and the department's only going to continue to grow as the city grows as, grows as well. So having a new facility that can handle that kind of growth was the top priority and that's why it's coming to the, the voters in April. A new facility will allow us to future-proof the O'Fallon Police Department. It will allow us a better travel time with it more centrally located. It will also give us an opportunity to improve our technology within the building itself. For instance, our communication center with our dispatchers will have a, a state-of-the-art system that they're able to work in rather than the, the small quarters that they're in now. This will allow us to continue to improve our service to the community for years to come. Our police department really does a great job with working with the community and the, the bond between our residents and our officers is tremendous and we want to keep that going forward. Um, we really encourage our residents to research this issue, take a look at it. We'll have information on our website at www.ofallon.mo.us. It explains everything about the proposition. Also, if you look in your city newsletter that is coming out this spring, you'll have all the details in there. We just ask our residents, please take a look at this issue, research it thoroughly, and then whatever you decide, please come out to vote on April 7th. A recent archaeological dig in Dames Park yielded some intriguing conclusions about O'Fallon's frontier past. Now let's find out what was discovered. 
The city of O'Fallon's Parks Board recently requested that an archaeological site on the northeast side of Dames Park be tested to find out more information associated with the historic era of James Audrain. O'Fallon called me because they were interested to see how this, this part of the property was, was used in the past. They knew it had been, uh, was part of a site from the original survey when they first bought the property. One of the things that was kind of intriguing about it, it looks like that's where James Aldrain's house was at, who was one of the earliest settlers in O'Fallon. He was here by 1816. James and Mary Aldrain acquired property along Pruitt Creek. Aldrain established a home on this tract of land. He also operated a mill, a distillery, and a tavern. In November, Joe Harl and his archaeologists were able to locate artifacts that would have been consistent with the original James Audrain site. We found that there's, there's pits, there's cellars, and there's all kinds of historic artifacts there, but even found evidence of prehistoric use, um, possibly as early as 4,000 years ago. And he showed us a lot of history that I didn't know about O'Fallon, uh, where there were grist mills earlier, where we were a part of uh, a community that was close to Salt River Road. Uh, there was a, a grist mill there and a hotel, all in an area where I thought there was nothing. There's just trees there right now. And uh, I believe that there's probably a lot of locations throughout the area here that people would be very surprised about the history of. For Joe Harl, digging up the past is a journey complete with twists and turns. It's not that we're just trying to find the, another arrowhead. I mean, it's, you've seen one arrowhead, you've seen them all. I get more excited, though, about learning about the past, and that's what we're doing. We're working like crime scene investigators, and then you go through and look at these tiny little pieces, and then from that, figure out what happened in the past. And what we're finding is that a lot of times it's different than what we've been tra traditionally taught. Once the dig was finished and all the findings were completed, Joe Harl came out to the city of O'Fallon and presented the facts. What was really interesting is that he was able to portray that to us and show us the time period and things that they would have expect to find in a home and the type of person that would own that type of pottery or that type of a, a vase or that type of a, a piece of furniture. Uh, he had little slivets that he could show what it, and he had pictures of what it really related to. And what was really shocking to me is he found that there was a lot more there that we should probably take time to look at. Testing operations revealed that this site does have intact cultural remains that can continue to provide insights into O'Fallon's earliest residents. We're hoping to do some more digs. I mean, Joe got us all pretty excited. Uh, hopefully we can work that in a budget or find a way that they can find funding to get a little more of that. Another thing that we're talking about is we're pretty excited about what they've already found is being able to communicate that to the, the public and walking trails with information boards because I think people would get out to see that and, and really be amazed at what our, our community was in the past and we keep growing. If you would like to check out a copy of Joe Harl's findings online, you can go to www.ofallon.mo.us. It's time for a break. When we come back, we'll learn about an organization that aids those in need. Then we'll give you a brief history of St. Joseph's Chapel and the Sisters of the Most Precious Blood. You're watching O'Fallon Matters.
Welcome back to O'Fallon Matters. This year, the Fort Zumwalt School District is leading the way in innovative new classroom curriculum. Let's check out their two newest classes. Conducting a medical investigation and programming a computer game don't sound like they'd fit in alongside the usual Spanish and math classes. But here at Fort Zumwalt School District, it's how students are leading the way in so STEM coursework. STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, prepares students for a rapidly changing workplace. The world is changing. Uh, STEM jobs are growing faster than jobs in all other areas combined. And for our students to be competitive in the real world, we really need to give them STEM experiences in the classroom. That's why the Fort Zumwalt School District has partnered with Project Lead the Way, America's top provider of STEM programs. This year, Fort Zumwalt has debuted two new classes, and the coursework offered will continue to expand in the coming years. The computer sciences curriculum will prepare students for an ever-increasing range of computer-related fields, and the hands-on training will introduce students to programming languages and app design. This course gives freshmen the opportunity to possibly get college credit. Um, they also really get experiences um, in the field of computer science. Uh, they actually explore uh, computer coding and computer science as it relates to different types of problems that are solved in the real world and on different types of devices. They start out with no knowledge at all. Some of them have a little bit. And we go in through and do a little bit of gaming because all students like to game. They start out with some scratch programming, which is a free software. We do a little bit of app development, and then we go into a general overview of Python. Most of the activities we do are fun, and, they, and I actually learn something, so I'm engaged the entire time, and I'm actually interested in this stuff, so it's fun. It's not just math, and it's not just social studies. It's something that applies to them, and it's something that is needed out in the workforce. The introductory course for the Biomedical Sciences curriculum allows students to explore the concepts of biology and medicine, introducing human physiology, basic biology, medicine, and research processes. The course is really designed for any student who's interested in going on to a career in biomedical sciences, whether that be a doctor or a nurse um, or you know, even a technician. It is all based around this fictional woman who has uh, died at the beginning of the class from a mysterious illness and the course is basically set up for those students uh, to kind of figure out why she died. So it immerses them into the biomedical science role. I like how it's a very hands-on class as opposed to uh, reading out of the textbook or doing notes. You can experience things for yourselves and kind of learn for, for yourself in, instead of you know just doing boring notes and it's a lot more fun. We learn all kinds of different things in here that I wouldn't learn in a normal class. We do things with diabetes, sickle cell has been what we've been focusing on lately and it just exposes me to a lot of different things in the medical world that I wouldn't get in a normal class here at West. My students get to do things that I didn't get to do until we were in college. Um, they are doing DNA gel electrophoresis, they're learning how to stain cells. Uh, instead of being handed a uh, prepared slide and they look at it, they get to learn the process behind that. So if they become a laboratory technician, they'll know those steps and skills that are needed uh, in that job. Fort Zumwalt is committed to preparing students for the changing world, and these unique STEM courses are a great introduction to the world of science and technology. I think when you offer this at an earlier age, a lot of students you know, maybe they have an affinity for this, or maybe they have a really strong interest, or they're really, really good at it. I think that it can get them focused on what they want to do as a career at an earlier age, and I think it really gives them a jump start when they get to college to really have a strong idea of what it is that they want to do. Because of my future job, I want to be in physical therapy, so I thought it would be a great opportunity to learn more about um, the scientific field and take as many science classes as I can, so that way I'll be more prepared for college. I'm interested in being a pharmacist when I grow up, so this seemed like a really good opportunity for me to learn more about the biomedical world and things that biomedical professionals do like pharmacists. 
Next year, the Fort Zumwalt School District will introduce an engineering component to their Project Lead the Way curriculum, and more classes will be added in the coming years. These classes are a great way to earn college credit and even professional certification, and it's preparing students for a 21st century workplace. There's a strong demand in the real world for STEM careers. It's not just that we want kids to be able to get out of school and make a good living and make a lot of money. I mean, we really want them to do something that's beneficial, that makes the world a better place to live in, and something that they can be proud of what they do and something that they love. This next story features an organization which helps the poor and homeless get back on their feet one step at a time. Joe Meyer has their story. First Step Back Home is a 501c3 public charity that serves the homeless and working poor of St. Charles, Lincoln, and Warren counties. Founder and President Paul Cruz and his wife Lana have helped over 6,000 people get back on their feet in the past 10 years. Well, certainly the, the main goal is to get the homeless and the working poor one step further in their self-sufficiency roles. Um, ideally, to become um, able to take care of all of their own personal needs, pay their own bills, live in their own homes again. And primarily our role is first step back home is getting them off the streets and into some lodging so that they can get jobs and become self-sufficient as soon as possible. 43.6 million people in the United States are living in poverty. And oftentimes, individuals fall through the cracks. So First Step Back Home fills in those cracks with homeless crisis intervention and homeless prevention. They tell me their situation, what they need and all that. And then I'll uh, tell them what all requirements are and uh, you know what we expect out of them and counsel with them and just uh, basically work with them. I have a, uh, a system set up where all I have to do is call a motel and okay for the room and they can come in any time they can make it and uh, stay the, you know, the prescribed amount of time. First Step Back Home teams up with local churches and organizations to provide hot meals for those in need. In fact, a hot meal is provided every single night of the month. The need for donations and volunteerism are always present. We uh, spend over $50,000 a year in motel rooms just paying for shelter for people. And another need is uh, as for communication, they don't have cell phones, and they don't have money to buy minutes on their phones, so we buy cell phones for them, and uh, that helps them to uh, in a job, job search. We require them to submit 15 applications a day for work uh, for every day in a motel. The key to First Step Back Home success rate is that assistance is provided to those individuals who are capable of and a green advance to actively seeking self-supporting status. You know, when somebody's serious and willing, you know, to go any length to, to find a place and do the right thing, you know, I would I would definitely send them to post it back home. One of the only nonprofit organizations that really helped me as far as being a single male with no family or a wife, most of these places like Salvation Army only accept you as family. And he's the only nonprofit organization doing any help like this in this area for single males. It helped me, um, pointing me in the right direction to the pantries. Um, it helped me with finances. Um, had me pay a traffic ticket or two. Um, you know, helped me with my first month's rent here. And um, that's, that's the opportunity that he gave me. Getting a hold of Paul is the first step when seeking needed assistance. Yeah, we get 70 to 100 calls a week. And uh, just all referral, people know what I do and uh, they can count on me for helping people and, and working with them and all that. So they can refer to me and they just call me and then I just take their information and uh, try to meet with them and get more information. The more you know about somebody, the more you can help them. Paul and Lana continue their faith-based mission day in this was, and this day out. And please remember that you can help the near homeless football. and homeless of our community Antonio, with Turkey. your time, talent, prayers, and donations. Well, I think over the last 10 years since Paul started this ministry, he has really raised the awareness of the problem. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, not in my backyard, this homeless thing doesn't happen. But we're on a major interstate here, and there's a lot of cross-country travelers, there's a lot of people just moving from one place to another, and uh, there's a lot of homelessness going on just right here in our own region. 
If you need help or would like to find out more information on First Step Back Home, you can call them at 636-466-1365 or you can visit them on their website at www.firststepbackhome.net. There's a historic national landmark right on Main Street, and you've likely driven past it countless times. Today, we're going to take you inside the St. Joseph Chapel. There are few buildings in O'Fallon with as rich a history as St. Joseph's Chapel. Through the years, this Gothic chapel has been a place for education, for social history, for artistic endeavors, and above all else, for worship. The Sisters of the Most Precious Blood came to the New World in the early 1870s and built their mother house here in O'Fallon in 1874. O'Fallon at that time was just a small farming community and this Catholic infusion fostered an ongoing interest in the liturgical arts. As the city expanded, so did the Sisters and they built the St. Joseph Convent Chapel in 1925 to better serve the growing community. Before too long, they'd realized the need for even more space and the chapel was expanded and remodeled again in 1962. But through the years, the sisters never lost focus on what was really important, and the chapel provided an important addition to their way of life. For the community here and over the years, this has been our primary place of worship, and worship is really the center of what we are and do as a community. It's where we come together to do what is most important to us. Um, it's where we have held our most significant events, such as our religious professions, um, our jubilees, and our funerals. It's where life happens for us. This chapel rests on the picturesque village of St. Mary's site, just north of the railroad that runs through O'Fallon's oldest district. The imposing brick edifice and Gothic arch windows may look beautiful from the outside, but seeing it from within is inspirational. Maybe the most outstanding feature is the artwork. In the history of churches, the art was almost like a painted gospel. It told the biblical stories that we remember. And so in the older part of the chapel, uh, we have artwork that was painted by a German immigrant. His name was Gottfried Schiller. Um, I think this is, as far as I know, one of the few remaining places where his art is still Visible. Gottfried Schiller's work includes the painted medallions that tell the story of the Sisters of the Most Precious Blood, as well as the life-size Stations of the Cross, and his art remains an important part of the chapel today. When the chapel was renovated and expanded, there were now more walls to decorate, a task which fell to the Director of Ecclesiastical Art Department, Sister Hiltrudis Powers. Inspired by Gottfried's work, Sister Powers added murals to the sides of the chapel and created the intricate tester hanging above the altar. But her most dramatic work has provided illumination to visitors for years. Sister's masterpiece, I think, are the windows. She not only chose the colors, but also did um, painting on the glass itself, which gives it the, the texture and the definition. Sister Powers was also a talented metal worker, and the massive metal grill separating the old altar from the new is a beautiful example of her work. But as things have changed for the Sisters of the Most Precious Blood, they have never forgotten their roots. Of course, it helps that a piece of their history traveled to the new world with them, and has resided in an attached chapel room ever since. In that altar down at the bottom is a wax image of the martyr Faustus, but the altar itself came, I don't know how, they must have taken apart, but came from Europe when the sisters first came over here. And it uh, depicts different images of this, like the scourging of Jesus and different um, times when his blood was shed. Anyway, it's very decorative, or very ornate. This chapel was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2007, and it's not hard to understand why. This building is steeped in history and still a strong part of the O'Fallon community. With daily masses and regular services, you're welcome to join the sisters in worship within these walls. They also provide tours to groups and organizations, and it's worth a trip to the north end of O'Fallon to experience the beauty of this chapel. 
Somebody told me once about how she believed that the prayers of all the people that ever had prayed were just kind of in the walls, you know, seeped in, so to speak. And I've often thought about that uh, with this chapel here, that these are living stones that make it because it's enlivened with all that has gone on here over many years. Thanks for joining us today. If you have a good story idea, let us know. You can send us an email at O'FallonTV at O'Fallon.mo.us. See you next time, and remember to give back to your community because O'Fallon matters to all of us.